All right, let's pray and we'll begin. Lord, thank you for another Sunday where we can gather together as your people. We can gather together to worship you, to reflect on your goodness and your provision for us. Another week where we can open your word and we can study uh, to know you, to understand who you are and your glorious plans, your glorious working throughout history to bring about salvation and redemption for the sake of your name. I ask that you bless our time of study this morning, our time of worship together, that you'd receive all the honor and glory, that you'd help us uh, as we engage with scripture to learn and to understand, but also to obey and to love and to be changed. So we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, we are continuing our series on eschatology, and this will be um, not the last, but one of the last. We have one more lesson after this that will deal with eschatological events. Uh, Carrie Wilson next week will be talking about the eternal state, the new heavens and the new earth. But we have one more event on the, the timeline, so to speak, that we wanted to talk about uh, concerning eschatology, and that is the rapture. Let's define our terms first. What does the word rapture mean? The English word rapture, just a little bit of linguistics here, comes from the Latin word raptura. So we say rapture because there's a Latin word, raptura. You'll hear many people say, well, the word rapture is never found in the Bible. Why do you believe in a rapture? It's nowhere in Scripture. Well, the Bible wasn't written in Latin. It was written in Greek and Hebrew. The Bible was translated into Latin. And that some of the Latin words have had an influence on our English language. And raptura is the, what we call English word rapture. And it's the Latin translation of a Greek New Testament word, harpazo. So the word harpazo is a biblical word. And it's found um, at least 14 times throughout the New Testament so rapture comes from the Latin translation of that Greek word. Is that clear as mud? You see where we get the, the term from now? Harpazo, what does it mean, the Greek word? Harpazo means to suddenly remove or to snatch away. And we see this used in a number of ways in the New Testament. It can be used to describe stealing or plundering or removing. In fact, when Jesus tells the parable about uh, the seed that falls on different types of soil... Remember that there's some seed that falls on the hard-packed soil and the birds come and snatch it away? It's this word, harpazo. It also describes uh, Philip uh, in the book of Acts being carried away by the Spirit into the desert. And there he shares the gospel with this man from Ethiopia. And this man is converted and he takes the gospel back with him to Africa and the church is established there. Um, it also describes Paul's experience that he describes in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, of being caught up into the third heaven. Uh, if you remember in 2 Corinthians 12, Paul talks about this experience of basically being in the presence of God, seeing heaven, and he says, I can't tell you all about it. I've been, I'm not allowed to, but harpazo is the word that describes him being uh, caught up. And it also describes in Revelation 12, 5, what happened to Jesus Christ, that after his resurrection, he's with his disciples, um, and he is carried up into the heavens and ascends into the clouds. So this word harpazo is used a number of times in the New Testament, and it is also used to describe the catching away of the church by Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 18 says, I'm just going to jump right into verse, um, uh, verse 16, it says, The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up. That's our word harpazo. That's the word that got translated into the Latin Vulgate as raptura, which then later has been often described in English as a rapture. It says, we who are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. So this is sort of the, the definition we're, we're using. When we talk about rapture, we're talking about the church being caught up together uh, with the dead in Christ to meet the Lord Jesus in the air. And then following that event, it says we will always be with the Lord. So there's several different components of the rapture. It includes the appearing of Jesus Christ, 1 Thessalonians 4.16, which we just read. Uh, also in John 14, verse 3, Jesus says, If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. Um, and Jesus continues, so that where I am in heaven, there you may be also. So it includes the appearing of Jesus. It includes the resurrection of dead saints, like 1 Thessalonians 4 describes. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 says they will be raised imperishable. And he says, I tell you this, it's a mystery uh, that we will all be changed and the dead in Christ will be raised imperishable. 
It includes the translation of living believers. Those who are alive and remain shall be caught up. So it's not just the dead, it's also the living. It includes a glorious reunion that we will meet the Lord in the air. We will always be with him. And it includes a giving of glorified bodies. 1 Corinthians 15 says the perishable must put on the imperishable. Um, Philippians 3 uh, speaks about how the Lord Jesus Christ will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory. So these are all the things that are happening in this event. It includes all of these, the appearing of Jesus, the resurrection of dead saints, the, the translation or the, the transformation of living believers, a glorious reunion with Christ, and the giving of glorified bodies. So big question is, how important is this doctrine? Does it really matter that we get it right? Does it matter that we agree? Does it matter that you even understand this, or could you have slept in an extra 45 minutes this morning and not bothered to come to Sunday school? Or is this really important, and anybody who disagrees with us isn't really a Christian? Okay, that's another extreme. You know, you put people, you know, in, in, there's these two ditches. One is we don't care because it's hard to understand and people disagree. The other ditch is this is super important and anybody who gets it wrong is my enemy. Um, how important is this doctrine? Well, just a, a number of points just to, I think, give us some perspective. Number one, we need to understand this is not a load-bearing wall for the Christian faith. If you've ever done any construction, you know, there's some walls you can knock out. Uh, when we moved into our house, we took out a few walls there's other walls you can't take out because if you do, the whole structure comes down. So the doctrine of the rapture, while it's important, it's worth looking at, it's not a load-bearing wall. This is not a major foundational doctrine of the Christian faith. This is not an essential, this is not a matter of orthodoxy. Um, it's not a load-bearing wall where if you change your view on this, it has drastic um, consequences for the integrity of the Christian faith. Just like taking out a load-bearing wall compromises the integrity of, of a building. So it's not that. Secondly, I think I already mentioned this, it's not a matter of orthodoxy or false teaching. Somebody who gets this a little bit wrong, who takes a, maybe a different view than how you would or, or however you might put it, they're not a heretic, they're not a false teacher. Uh, they're godly Christians who are faithful Christians who disagree on this. So let's just keep it in the right category there. And then third, I just like to always point out that our understanding of the rapture is not as impactful as our understanding of the millennial kingdom. So if you're trying to prioritize which issues to study, if you've not really studied eschatology, I would encourage you to spend your time first figuring out what are all these promises about the kingdom. Does Jesus come before or after this millennial kingdom? And what's the nature of this kingdom? I think that has far more impact on how we read the whole Bible. It impacts far more passages of scripture. And it really establishes a paradigm for how you understand God's working throughout history. So the millennial issue is far more significant than the rapture. But typically people get really, really interested in the rapture. They don't really study the millennial kingdom. And it's kind of like trying to put the roof on your house before you build all the walls and frame it out and hang your sheetrock. Like you get really excited about the, this kind of finishing touch and neglect to build the, the groundwork first, the framework underneath it. So. Um, this doctrine of the rapture, it's not a load-bearing wall, it's not a matter of orthodoxy or false teaching, and it's not as impactful as our understanding of the kingdom. Um, some of this is my opinion, you might find people who disagree, but this is how I see it. On the flip side, um, it does reflect how much we value the teaching of Jesus. It does reflect how much we value the scripture itself. It shows if we care or don't care about the truth, so it is worth studying. And we think it's worth having convictions on, and that's why we've even taken a position on the rapture in our church's statement of faith, that we as elders, as pastors, are unified in our interpretation of this doctrine, and we believe it strongly enough to teach it and try to persuade you to agree with us. So we don't think it's just to each their own, doesn't matter what you believe. We, we actually do think it's valuable and important because we value the teaching of Christ and the, and the, the truth of Scripture. Um, and it also does have practical importance. Um, the doctrine of the rapture is intended to produce comfort and hope for the Christian. So this isn't just a theoretical debate. We think it's actually practical. And it's intended um, to have both ethical and emotional, spiritual, psychological you know, impact on us. It's supposed to affect how we live. So there is uh, importance there. So we conclude that it should be studied and understood as a feature of our eschatology. So I just want to put sort of both of these perspectives out there to hopefully sort of balance us in the right place we need to be. That the rapture matters, 
but it's not the most important doctrine in the world. Does that make sense? So we're going to approach it that way. Um, so just a little bit of review. Um, we talked about millennial views in the big picture. Um, there's the amillennial view, which says Jesus returns in between the church age and the eternal state. There is no kingdom. The post-millennial view teaches that following the church age, there will be this kingdom, and following the establishment of the kingdom, Christ will return. Then there's the view we teach, which is the premillennial view, which is that following the church age, Jesus will return, he will establish his kingdom, and then it leads into the eternal state. So this is sort of just zooming out a little bit to remind ourselves of the big picture. Okay, this is the big picture of what God is doing in history, the church age, the return of Christ, the eternal state, now, the kingdom of God, how those things fit together. So what we're doing, we've chosen the premillennial view at this church. That's what we're convinced is the, the most biblical, the best explanation. But we want to zoom in a little bit and look very carefully at the return of Christ. Because the doctrine of the rapture is, if you could zoom in on this whole thing, is, is a, comp, it's a, um, a whole bunch of complex events that are all mingled together. And we're going to talk about how they all relate to each other. And it all surrounds this event of the coming of Christ. So keep in mind the big picture. We're zooming in on the events surrounding the return of Christ and trying to understand how the rapture fits into this. There's a number of events connected with the return of Christ. The rapture, resurrection, uh, this key biblical theme in the Old Testament and New Testament called the Day of the Lord, which is connected to uh, what, we, what we know as the Great Tribulation, um, spoken about in Daniel, in the teaching of Jesus, the teaching of Paul. Uh, Daniel's 70th week uh, describes sort of this seven-year period where all these things kind of climactically come together. Um, Paul tells the Thessalonians about the appearing of a man of lawlessness, this antichrist figure that's associated with all these events. Uh, Jesus tells us about all these cosmic signs that will take place. Uh, so these are all these sort of uh, events that are connected with the return of Christ. So the rapture is one of these. And so it's, it's probably easy just from looking at this list to imagine how people might organize and arrange and connect all of these different components in a variety of ways. Um, but just to summarize our view, we teach that these events take place, all of them, at the end of the church age, prior to the millennial kingdom, and they're connected with the second coming of Jesus. Um, so we don't have time to really do expansive teaching on all of these topics. We're talking about the rapture specifically today. Uh, but, but the rapture is one of these components that's all sort of com uh, combined together that surrounds uh, the return of Jesus Christ. So here's the key question. What is the relationship between the rapture, this catching up of the church, and the seven-year period known as Daniel's 70th week or the Great Tribulation or the Day of the Lord? And I'm simplifying a little bit. There can be overlap with some of these terms and distinctions within these terms. But what's the connection? What's the relationship between the rapture and this time of tribulation and judgment that's coming on the world. Will the church be present and experience these things? Um, will the rapture happen before them or during them or after them? And as you can imagine, just like there's multiple views of how the millennial kingdom works out and when Christ returns, there's also three basic views on the rapture. And again, I'm simplifying here, uh, but I'm just going to present these to you. The first would be the, tr the pre-tribulation rapture view. And I've simplified this, but you could understand it this way, that following the church age, there's going to be a rapture, a catching away of believers to be with Christ. That's represented by the blue arrow there. Following that, there will be this seven-year period of tribulation. And at the end of this seven years, the red arrow signifies Christ's physical return to earth, where he comes to judge and to establish his millennial kingdom. So this view would be known as the pre-tribulation rapture. There's a second view which we could call the mid-tribulation rapture. Um, very similar to the, what I described before, except the church is caught away at, so, at the midpoint of the tribulation. Three and a half years in, halfway through this seven years of tribulation, there are some who teach that the church will be captured uh, or, or caught away and taken to heaven to be with Christ. And one sort of um, tweak or modification to this view, some would put it in the last sort of fourth of the tribulation and it would be called the pre-wrath view, and they would see that the church is caught away prior to the worst part of the tribulation right towards the end. So again, I'm sort of simplifying these things, but these are uh, kind of, this is a mid-tribulation view of the rapture. The church is caught away in the middle at some point um, during the seven-year period. And then the third view would be the post-tribulational rapture, and this view would see that the church goes through this time of tribulation, 
The church perseveres, suffers greatly, but ultimately makes it to the end of this seven-year tribulation on the whole earth. And then they are caught up into the air to meet Christ as he is coming back down to earth. So this view takes the rapture and the second coming of Jesus and sort of combines it into one simultaneous event. And then following that, following the return of Christ, we have this millennial kingdom or the eternal state, depending on your millennial view. Did I confuse everyone on all of that? Let's go back through that again real quick. So you have the pre-tribulation view where the church is caught away before the tribulation, the mid-tribulation rapture, or someone hold to a pre-wrath rapture, which says it happens at some point during the tribulation. And then there's a post-tribulational view, which says the church goes through it and is caught away at the end. So we teach a pre-tribulation view here at this church. Um, and I'm going to share with you a few reasons why. Why a pre-tribulation rapture? Well, number one, we believe that God has not destined us for wrath. 1 Thessalonians 5.9 says God has not destined us for wrath but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. In the context there, the Apostle Paul is teaching about the day of the Lord and this time of great judgment that is coming. Some people were concerned, they were afraid that they were in it. And and they were worried about that. And Paul is seeking to comfort them and assure them that that is not the case. Uh, Similarly, in Revelation 3.10, Jesus says to one of the churches there, because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. Um, And he doesn't just say he will keep them from the trial. He says he'll keep them from the hour of trial, the time when this trial is taking place. And I think that this principle is true for not just that local church, but for the church in general. Uh, We understand that the day of the Lord, the great tribulation, is a time of great wrath. It's divine judgment where God's Uh, justice is being poured out on the earth in some pretty drastic and and horrific ways. We see this described um, in the book of Revelation. Jesus talks about it in Matthew 24 and other places. And God has not destined his children to experience his wrath. Christ already suffered the wrath of the Father on our behalf. He absorbed the wrath of God as he hung on the cross. So while Christians may suffer, we face cancer and persecution and deal with all sorts of of suffering in this world, we do not suffer the wrath of God. Um, That is something that is not our destiny. God has not destined us for wrath. Secondly, as we read the book of Revelation, in chapters 6 through 18, we see the description of this great tribulation. And there's a complete absence of the church throughout all of this. I believe the church is mentioned, I want to say it's 13 times or 19 times in the first three chapters of Revelation. Um, And then never again for this whole duration. Um, And the reason for that is that we believe this period of time of tribulation, what you could understand is Daniel's 70th week, you can look at Daniel chapter 9, um, that it has uniquely to do with the nation Israel. If you read Daniel chapter 9, uh, it talks about your people, your holy city. It's this prophecy, and it has to do with the nation Israel. Um, And so the church seems to be conspicuously absent during this description of the tribulation, Revelation 6 through 18. Um, It's one reason we we believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. Third reason would be that the taking away of the church before the return of Christ to earth allows time for the marriage supper of the Lamb to take place. In Revelation chapter 19, verses 6 through 10, um, the apostle John describes this scene in heaven. It says, let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come And his bride has made herself ready. It was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. So if you can just think with me for a moment, if we take the post-tribulational view, that the saints are raptured up to meet Christ as he comes to the earth to establish his millennial kingdom, then there's no point at which the entire church is gathered in heaven to enjoy this celebratory meal. So we think a pre-tribulation rapture allows time for this key event to take place, where the bride has been made ready. You know, the church is described as the bride. We're anticipating this reunion with our bridegroom, and we're told there's going to be this great celebration. And it takes place in heaven. And so the pre-tribulation rapture allows for this to happen. And a fourth, and this is what I want to spend more time on, a fourth reason we hold to a pre-tribulation rapture view is because I think the Bible describes a few differences between the rapture 
and the second coming, that event that's described in Revelation 19, where Christ comes seated on a white horse, a robe dip in, dipped in blood. He's coming to judge and to conquer and establish his kingdom. There's differences between that glorious personal return of Jesus Christ to earth and the catching away of the saints to heaven. And I don't know if that's too small to read, but I'll read through it for you. Just comparing these two events, the rapture and the second coming of Christ, we could call the second coming proper, if you will. Um, the rapture, in the rapture, Christ comes in the air and returns to heaven, according to 1 Thessalonians 4.17. We're caught up to meet the Lord in the air, to be with him where he is. Uh, similarly, in John 14, he goes and he says he's preparing a place for us so that he can take us to be where he is and dwell with him. However, the second coming describes Christ coming to earth to dwell and to reign here on the earth in this physical realm. So these seem to be describing different events. The rapture is a description of Christ gathering his own, 1 Thessalonians 4, once again, that Jesus is gathering his saints. In Matthew 24, we have a description of the second coming, where Christ returns to earth, and it says the angels gather the elect. And we would understand the elect to refer to believing Israel and any who have come to saving faith during that time of the tribulation. But it seems to be a different kind of event. In 1 Thessalonians, Jesus comes to reward, and the second coming... Christ comes to judge. We see this in Matthew 25. Um, In the rapture, resurrection is prominent. In the second coming, as we read all the passages that describe Christ's coming to earth, there's never any resurrection mentioned. It seems to be a different event taking place. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4 describes that in the rapture, believers depart the earth. But in Matthew 24, we see that when Christ returns, it's unbelievers that will be taken away. Matthew 24 gives us the parable of the wheat and the tares. And Jesus says when the master returns, then he will pull out the weeds and get rid of them and burn them. He's removing unbelievers when he comes back. Similarly, there's the parallel of the dragnet. Jesus talks about how a fisherman casts his net and he pulls in all sorts of fish. And then he sits there in his boat and he picks out the bad ones and chucks them back into the lake. He's removing unbelievers when he comes back. Um, Similarly, in Matthew 24, Jesus says that when the Son of Man returns, it will be like the days of Noah when nobody thought anything was going to happen, but then the flood came, and the flood swept away the unbelievers in judgment. So Jesus says there will be two men working in the field or two women grinding at the mill, and one will be taken, the other left. And this is describing a taking away in judgment, and it's connected not to the rapture, but to the second coming of Jesus Christ. So we believe that believers are departing the earth in the rapture, but in the second coming of Jesus, it's unbelievers that are being judged and removed. Um, The flip side of that coin would be that after the rapture, it's unbelievers who remain on the earth. But at the second coming, it's believers who remain. The the wheat is left planted. The good fish are kept in the net. Those who are not judged stay at the mill or working in the field. Believers remain. The rapture in in John 14.1 describes believers going to be with Jesus in heaven. But the second coming in Matthew 25 describes Jesus coming to establish his kingdom on earth. So there's distinctions and differences here. At the rapture, believers receive glorified bodies, 1 Corinthians 15. Um, But at the second coming of Jesus, we don't see the giving of glorified bodies in the same way. Paul called, um, in 1 Corinthians 15, he called this event of the rapture and the glorification of living saints that would happen with it, he called it a mystery. But the second coming of the Son of Man is clearly prophesied all throughout the Old Testament. There's not much that's mysterious about it. So I think that there's a difference between the coming of Jesus for his saints at the rapture and the coming of Jesus with his saints at the second coming. Revelation 19, we see that when Jesus returns, seated on the white horse with a robe dipped in blood, that the armies of heaven are coming with him arrayed in fine linen. That fine linen robe, that's always a description of righteousness of the saints. So we see that there's these two different aspects and, and this is sort of compressed together in, in the terms of church history. Think about, you know, at this point, the church age is at least 2,000 years. The millennial kingdom will be 1,000 years. Then there's this little seven-year slice where a whole bunch of stuff is happening. And sometimes we can get these two events mixed up because we're looking at things from a distance. And, and biblical prophecy, when it's telescopically looking ahead, often sort of, you know, compacts all of these things together. But I think a careful study, careful observation, and the unfolding light of Scripture 
makes clear that there's these two different phases to the return of Christ. I don't believe in two different separate Uh, two different second comings. I would still call all of this together as a package, the second coming of Christ, but there's sort of these two phases to it. So that's the difference. I think there's a difference between the rapture and the second coming, and we think it makes the best sense to, to see this rapture taking place at the beginning, not being a simultaneous event at the end of the tribulation. And then a fifth reason for a pre-tribulational rapture, it's a mouthful, would be the Bible's teaching on imminency. The Bible's teaching on imminency. The question is, so when is this rapture going to happen? Could this happen at any moment? Do we need to be ready right now? Or are there other things that have to happen first uh, before this sort of triggering event of this whole complex events could take place? Well, there are several texts that urge us to be watchful, to be ready, to wait for his appearing with expectancy because we do not know the day or the hour. And we don't have time to go through all of them today, but you can probably think of several just off the top of your head. We're supposed to be watchful. We're supposed to be ready. We're supposed to stay awake. Uh, We're supposed to be expectant because we don't know when he's coming back. But on the flip side, there's other texts that describe cosmic signs, world events, a man of lawlessness appearing, major apostasy and rebellion taking place before the return of Christ. So oftentimes, as we read and study scripture, we feel this tension. Well, which is it? Am I supposed to be ready because it could happen at any moment? Or am I supposed to be ready after these other things happen and then I get ready? Because I know that Jesus can't come back until all these signs are fulfilled. Which is it? Do we believe in an imminent return of Christ in that sense that the next thing on the the biblical calendar is the catching way of the church? Or do we not believe in imminency uh, that there's certain signs that have to happen before we would experience uh, this rapture, being caught up to meet the Lord in the air. There's a few different solutions for this tension. And uh, Wayne Grudem, systematic theologian, has offered three different potential solutions. And I think it's a really good summary, so I'm going to share his points on this, um, even though I don't agree with his conclusions. Um, one potential solution, solution is to say, well... Apparently, the rapture could not happen at any moment because the signs have not yet been fulfilled. There haven't been cosmic signs in the heavens. The stars have not fallen from the sky. The moon has not turned to blood. The sun has not been darkened. Uh, The man of lawlessness has not yet appeared. There hasn't been a great apostasy. You know, you could say, well, the rapture could not happen at any moment. These signs have not yet been fulfilled. I think there's a few problems with this view. First is that it blurs the distinction between the first and second phase of Christ's coming. The rapture, Christ coming for his saints, and the coming of the Son of Man in Revelation 19, where he comes with his saints. That's where, if we go back to that chart where I laid out all those differences side by side, I think if you answer the problem this way, you're blurring the distinction between the rapture and the second coming and making them one event, which I don't think is the best solution. Second problem is that I think this solution, this answer, blunts the force of the New Testament Testament commands. Be ready, be watchful, be on guard, be alert, don't be asleep, uh, be expectant. Well, if all these other things have to happen first, it sort of robs all of those commands of their ethical and emotional impact. They just don't really land on us the way that I think Jesus intended them to. A third problem with this solution is that I think it misunderstands the unique nature of Daniel's 70th week as pertaining to Israel. The signs described, people often say, well, why are these signs given if we're not going to see them? These signs are for Israel and for others who will come to saving faith during the tribulation. Again, Daniel 9.24 says, 70 weeks are decreed about your people, Daniel, about your holy city, Daniel. If we interpret this in a straightforward, simple manner, God is talking to Daniel about Jerusalem and the nation Israel. And so this 70th week, you know, week is a group of seven. This final group of seven years has to do uniquely with Israel. So if we stick the church in there and apply that experience to the New Testament church, I think we're blurring the distinction between the church and Israel. So I don't think this is the best solution to say that the rapture could not happen at any moment because the signs have not yet been fulfilled. So there's another solution, which is to say that the rapture could happen at any moment because the signs have already been fulfilled. 
Uh, some people, not many, but some people will take uh, this approach, but I think there's a few problems with that as well. I think it overstates the fulfillment of all of these promises about signs by looking back to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 and saying, I think most of this has already happened. I think the man of lawlessness was Nero. I think the, all the tribulation and judgment described was the destruction of the temple and the burning down of Jerusalem. So all of this has already happened. This is a view known as preterism, uh, just saying it's, it's already fulfilled. But I think that's really overstating, um, as terrible as it was, what happened to the Jews um, in AD 70, as awful as that day was. I think it's overstating those events. Um, Jesus says it's a time of tribulation coming upon the whole world. Uh, something that is unlike anything that had ever happened before and unlike anything that would ever happen again. And as terrible as the destruction of Jerusalem was, there's been worse things since. Uh, so I don't think this quite fulfills um, all of the, the promises of the signs that are supposed to appear. Um, the other problem, I think, is that uh, some who would say that it's already been fulfilled, they would tend to read prophecy, tend to read revelation as being more symbolic. They'd say, well, there's an antichrist in every age, and there's tribulation in every age. We don't read revelation as describing future events. It's just sort of descriptive of what every generation experiences. There's some who would read eschatology that way. Um, and I think that's just um, an inconsistent way to interpret scripture and not the best not the best approach um, to understanding some of those passages that talk about future events, to read them purely symbolically and not as real future literal uh, events. So I don't think the best solution to this imminency question is to say the rapture could happen at any moment because the signs have already been fulfilled. So there's the third solution. Uh, the rapture could happen at any moment because many of the signs that we see described in scripture refer to the return of Jesus to earth, the second coming, and not the rapture. And this is the view that I take, the view we teach at this church. We teach that Christ could take his bride home at any moment. So all the warnings and the, the instructions to be ready and to be watchful, uh, that they apply directly. They mean exactly what they say. Uh, there's no qualifications um, that we need to put on those. And we also think that the signs described in Scripture will take place. We just think it'll take place after the rapture, during Daniel's 70th week, before the coming of the Son of Man, which Jesus describes there in Matthew 24. It's prophesied in Daniel and in other places as well. So that's the solution we take. So we do teach um, from the pulpit here this position of imminency. that We think Jesus could return for his saints at any moment. But obviously we understand there's this whole complex of events, this whole bundle of things that has to happen, which is triggered by the rapture, that must take place before the second coming of Jesus. So here's our statement of faith. This is from our doctrinal statement. It says, We teach the imminent personal appearance of Jesus Christ to catch away his church prior to a seven-year tribulation on earth. Um, and we sort of explain some of the other things we see that will be connected with that, that, he, that are triggered by that. So that is our position. Again, um, we don't see that this is a matter of orthodoxy. We have some in our church who would take a different view. We're fine with that. Uh, we just want you to understand why we teach this view, where we're coming from as pastors here. A few final thoughts um, before you go. Just let me encourage you as you study these issues, let scripture be your first and final authority. When you're trying to figure out truth about tribulation, the Antichrist, rapture, all of these different things, don't let novels or films or current events influence your interpretation of scripture. We had a great conversation about this yesterday with several of the men in the room when we were doing some study on hermeneutics. But we want our study of scripture to not be, we don't want to come at it with a certain bias or presupposition because of the things going around on around us in the world. Too many people will read the news, they'll see current events, and they'll try to fit all that together with, with what's going on in the Bible, and they'll build their theology based off of what they're seeing going on in the world around them. You might call that newspaper exegesis. We think that's backwards. Rather than reading the Bible through the lens of everything going on in the world around us, we need to read everything that's going on in the world around us through the lens of the Bible. We want to switch that around. So let Scripture be your first and final authority. And let me encourage you secondly, don't become so fixated on this doctrine. A lot of people do this. It becomes a hobby horse. It becomes a crusade for this specific teaching. Don't become so fixated on this 
really detailed, complex issue of interpretation that you lose sight of the big picture. The big picture is that we are in the church age now and Christ has promised to return. He is coming back. He's coming back to judge. He's going to raise the dead. He's going to give us glorified bodies. He's going to bring us into his kingdom and establish a new heaven and a new earth. That's the big picture. Don't lose sight of the big picture. Keep the focus on Christ. Keep the focus on his glory. It's great if you read the first few verses of the book of Revelation. It says it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's about him. It's about his glory. I think the reason that a lot of people get fixated on the doctrine of the rapture is because we really care about what's going to happen to us, don't we? What's going to happen to me? Am I going to face tribulation? Am I going to get raptured? And and we get very sort of self-centered. And the reason we care so much about this doctrine is because it's about what happens to us. And we don't really care as much about this future kingdom because, well, this kingdom is all about the glory of Christ. And I'm sure it's all going to work out. Well, shouldn't we be more concerned, more focused on what Jesus is doing to glorify himself? Well, that includes the rapture, yes. But let's not get so fixated on this because we've lost sight of the big picture and made this about ourselves. Don't get so fixated on this doctrine that you become angry or dismissive of other Christians. Okay, other people will interpret this differently than the way I've just explained it, and they have their reasons. Some reasons are better than others. We can be charitable. We can be respectful. We need to be humble no matter which position we land on. Third, don't become so fixated on this doctrine that you fail to draw spiritual nourishment from the biblical truth, okay? Um, We need to dig into this with patience. Um, If you can't figure all this out today, that's fine. If 80% of this flew over your head, that's really okay. Uh, I'm okay with that. I just want to expose you to, to these ideas, but I want you to be encouraged that Jesus is promising to come back for his people. He's not going to leave us here. Um, And he's going to bring us to be where he is so that we're always with him. This is good news. It's intended to produce comfort and hope. So dig in with patience and humility. And don't get so fixated on figuring it out that you fail to, to spiritually benefit from what the Bible teaches about the rapture of Jesus Christ. And then I would third, just throw out a third Final thought, don't neglect to study the eternally precious truths of God. If 80% of this went over your head and you say, you know what, I'm just going to let JD and some of these other guys figure it out. I don't think I need to really worry about it. Um, Let me just gently press in on that and encourage you, keep studying God's word. It's worth it. God's word is precious. There's a benefit here for you. So don't be frustrated if you can't figure it out in 10 minutes. Um, Don't be frustrated if it takes you a few years of careful study. Just be open-minded, keep studying the scripture, keep listening, and pursue the truth of God's word. Psalm 1 says that saints who meditate on God's law day and night are blessed. They have deep roots, and they're able to face every sort of season and bear fruit. That's what we want to be. That's what we want to do. So those are a few final thoughts on the doctrine of the rapture, finished with even just a few minutes to spare. So again, if you have questions about this, and I'm sure you do, Um, I would love to know those ahead of time. I'll just be honest with you. This doctrine is so complex. um, And because it's not one of the most important doctrines, um, it would be helpful to your pastors if we could look up a few things and maybe study your questions for more than 20 seconds before we answer them. Um, There's a lot of things we can answer off the top of our heads, but we don't know everything. And it would be a blessing for us to prepare well so that we can give you a good and solid answer. So if you have questions about the rapture, about the millennial kingdom, the issues we've been talking about for the last several weeks, be sure to write those down, send those into us. You can just uh, email me or Stephen or come talk to one of us, and then we'll be able to have a discussion about this in a few weeks. So, all right, you have a few extra minutes to fellowship this morning. You're dismissed. We'll see you back here in about 20 minutes.